assassinated Baha Abu al Ghazza, a leader member of the Islamic Jihad in Gaza, and his wife, which sparked more violence in Gaza. Shortly after the killing, Islamic Jihad fired rockets into Israel. In response, Israel had launched extensive bombing attacks on Gaza, killing at least 34 Palestinians and injuring 109 others. Only one Israeli has been injured as a result of the Palestinian rockets so far. Hamas has refrained from engaging in violence during the latest attack. A ceasefire was announced on November 14th, but bombing continued on the night of November 14th. If the ceasefire does not hold and Israel continues its disproportionate and deadly attacks on Gaza, there is significant risk of continued escalation. Today we stand here in solidarity with our allies, underrepresented, underrepresented Muslim minority advocates, Young Democratic Socialists of America, Party for Socialism and Liberation, Black Students for Revolution, Movimiento Estudiante, Muslim Students Association, and Fossil Free. We'll start off with Fossil Free. Hello. All right. So I'm here on behalf of SCCS today, and as the largest and the oldest environmental student organization on campus, SCCS has and will stand in solidarity with SJP and liberation of Palestine and all peoples. As an environmental organization, one of the things that we hear a lot is how great Israel is for sustainability and preservation. You hear about their technology to save water, about how they contribute to forestation, and how they have great agricultural practices. Now, the idea that Palestine was a desert and the Israeli settlers came to this desert barren land and turned it green is a classical example of Palestinian erasure. Palestine was full of people, most of them farmers, who were amazing at their job, making Palestine one of the most agriculturally productive and sustainable places on the planet before the occupation. Israel does plant trees, but I find that the trees that they plant are a great reflection of what the settler colonizers that displaced the Palestinians were. The villages destroyed in Palestine uh, are covered with trees to cover evidence of the destruction of these very same villages that Palestinian people have inhabited for years. Um, these trees planted are non-native, which results in the deaths of the native plants that have been there for thousands of years. And yet these plants are not suitable for the climate and they cannot really survive in these plants. Just as nature rejects the invasive native plants brought by colonizers, which is a very common occurrence in any colony, we and the native Palestinians reject the occupation and colonization of Palestine that results in the deaths of the native people living there. We don't care if you plant trees if it means Palestinians lose their homes. We don't care if you say water if people in Gaza don't have any access to clean water. We don't, have, we don't care about your farming practices when you burn the farms of people who are dependent on that very food because their trade routes and in and out flows are completely blocked. Even though it is scientifically untrue that Israel is a sustainable, resilient country, we don't care if whatever progress you try to make always comes with an exclusion, degradation, oppression, and genocide of the Palestinian people. We are fed up with the greenwashing, we are fed up with the pinkwashing of this genocide. We support the basic human rights of Palestinians, we support the right of return of the displaced people of Palestine. Until all people are free, we will keep fighting for justice. Freedom from the burden of climate change only can come with the equality and freedom of all peoples. Until liberation for all, none of us are liberated. We won't be silenced anymore. We will always stand in solidarity with Palestinians. Until Palestinians are allowed into the lands that they lived in for thousands of years, until they have the same rights of all citizens in occupied Palestine, until Palestinians stop facing racism, oppression, human rights violations, and genocide, we will fight alongside for their liberty. Free Gaza, free Palestine. Now we're going to have a representative from Oma come speak. Can I give you? Hello everyone. Today I join you as a member of underrepresented Muslim and minority advocates and as a Palestinian American. UMA is primarily an outreach and activist organization that recognizes the role of intersectionality in the fight for social justice and we understand that all social issues stem from the same root oppressions of capitalism, white supremacy, and colonialism. Yesterday, I woke up to a picture of a one-month-old in a hospital bed who survived while eight of his family members were murdered by an Israeli missile that hit their home while they were sleeping. As a Palestinian in the diaspora, 
I feel the only thing I can do is elevate and humanize Palestinian voices. While the media tells you of the 34 Palestinians that were murdered by airstrikes, they fail to tell us about the Palestinians that have died by suicide as a result of the dire living conditions. What are the names of the Palestinians that were killed because of cholera? What are the names of the men, women, and children that were killed in hospitals because their lives relied on machines and the electricity plant was shut off? What do we make of the families who have been wiped out completely? How do we remember the names without living people to hold them? How do Palestinians go about their daily lives next week? How do they deal with the trauma of war? Palestinians don't even suffer trauma. Trauma requires space for a person to process a process an event to then label it traumatic, to see the effects it has on them. Palestinians are not even given that space to reflect on their experiences. They are constantly living in their nightmares and horrors. When we're constantly talking about Palestinian lives, somehow we forget to talk about the very things that make them human. Palestinians are stripped of their humanity every day through every headline, through every self-defense argument, when you hear the number of Palestinians murdered, think about their favorite food, their favorite season, what their dreams and aspirations were, what got them out of bed every morning. Humanize these lives, elevate their voices, and never forget. Thank you. We will now have Noah from Young Democratic Socialists in America. The UIUC Young Democratic Socialists condemns the strikes on Gaza underway this week by the Israeli military, which has already killed at least 34 Palestinians, many of them civilians. This action is consistent with a larger pattern of racist violence carried out, carried out for the purpose of political Zionism to drive indigenous Palestinians from their homes and create a Jewish ethno-state in Palestine. American politicians insist over and over again that Israel has the right to defend itself, and the IDF extols itself as the most moral army in the world, yet the disdain they show for Palestinian life shows that these are gross misrepresentations of the situation. This colonial project is carried out with the full support of the U.S. government and tacit support from this school, as shown by Chancellor Jones's willingness to capitulate to Zionist pressure and condemn a Palestinian student's anti-Zionist presentation in his recent mass mail and the investments the school retains in companies that do business with Israel. The UIUC YDSA reiterates its support for the global boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign, and it calls on the university to fully divest from corporations profiting off the slaughter. The subjugation of the Palestinian people is profitable. Israeli arms manufacturers deploy their weapons against protesters at home so they can sell them abroad as battle-tested to other human rights-abusing regimes, including the United States. On the other end of the capitalist ideological apparatus, the, capital, the capitalist class continues to stroke racism to keep us divided. Trump and other right-wing politicians are fond of telling us that Hispanic and Arab immigrants are the cause of our problems, not the capitalists seeking to coin our very lifeblood into gold. It is vital that we intertwine the struggle against capitalism, colonialism, and other forms of oppression as they are themselves linked. We stand in solidarity with the people around the world opposing colonial violence from Palestine where the people have not given in to Israel's intense demoralization campaign, to Bolivia, where indigenous people are fighting back against what seems to be a, fascist, a racist Christian fascist coup, and this country, where indigenous Americans are still resisting further colonial encroachments. We applaud the brave Palestinian activists and allies who bring the fight to campus, organizing daily to oppose the bullying of the well-funded and ruthless Zionists and other white supremacist astroturfers who are attempting to silence anyone who questions the legitimacy of the Zionist project. We saw an example of this just last month in the Zionist effort to stop a student government resolution meant to protect the right to criticize the Israeli state. We say to these forces, try as you might, the workers and oppressed people of the world will not be silenced. We will not stop fighting you until justice is won. Free Palestine. We will now have Daniel Ghanima from SJP come speak. Woo! 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 Hi everyone, my name is Denia and I'm with Students for Justice in Palestine. Mm -hmm. Alright, so 
just something interesting I thought would be important to bring to light is when I found out I was going to be speaking at this rally, I searched Gaza rally in my Google Docs and over five speeches came in. And that just shows you how consistent the Gaza bombings are. I had five speeches from my past to talk about and I had to make a new one and it's going to keep going this way. And today, uh, Malak already reiterated, but we are here to show the humanity behind the Gaza massacres. Every day, us Palestinians hear of a new death toll. We've heard it with the Great Return March, which is the most recently, and we're hearing it today with the recent Gaza massacre. In the Great Return March, over 200 Palestinian protesters in Gaza were killed in the span of two months. 60 Palestinians in Gaza were massacred in a single day alone. 10,000 were wounded and 5,000 were shot. And I just want us all to imagine those numbers right now. 10,000 wounded. And when I mean wounded, I don't mean like a paper cut. I mean permanent disabilities for the rest of their life. We saw medics, we saw reporters, and we saw innocent Palestinian children getting sniped down by Israeli soldiers through the border fence. And with the Great Return March, which was recently, all they were doing was protesting. They held their flags, they held their posters, they held their gufias, and they were sniped down one by one. With the recent Gaza massacre, they weren't even protesting. They were at home doing what normal people do, and their houses were getting air striked down one by one. Gaza has been declared a state of emergency since February. 97% of their water is undrinkable. Over 90% of the population has depression or PTSD. We call it the largest open air prison because no one is allowed in or out by land, air, and sea. They are stuck there. They are stuck in these inhumane conditions and they're not even allowed out or in. Uh, we see recently, like even cancer patients in Gaza are not allowed to leave to get treatment. They're not allowed. They're allowed to just sit there and die. And that's the goal of the Israeli regime. Doctors in Gaza, they have not been paid since 2014. For over five years, doctors have been treating Gaza civilians without even getting paid. And that just shows you the passion that these doctors have, the passion that the Gaza people have to keep fighting to be alive. Their hospitals are understaffed, they're under-equipped, schools are demolished. We saw it recently in the Gaza massacre. All that was left of the little seven-year-old boy, as you can see on that poster, was his school notebooks. <sighs> Families live on less than $2 a day to eat. Fighting for their basic human rights is their last chance at humanity, and even when they do so, they get sniped down. Israel continues to massacre those protesting and those just at home in hopes of ethnic genocide towards the Palestinian people. But it's also important to note that Palestinians aren't just numbers. We have names, we have stories, and we mourn, but we still resist. Recently, the IDF posted saying they were very strategic in every airstrike they did. So when that seven-year-old boy died, they were strategic in that. They admitted that. They said, as long as we get one terrorist, we're fine with the collateral damage. We're here to tell you that we are not collateral. That Amir Ayad is not your collateral. The 30-day-old 30 30 baby in the hospital is not your potential collateral. The youngest that was killed is two years old. They are not your collateral. And then another uh, tweet from the IDF said, they thought the house that they airstriked was empty. That, that airstrike killed eight people. You knew that house was not empty. And like I said, the youngest killed was two and the youngest injured was 35 days old. That 35 day old baby is gonna live the rest of their life knowing their eight family members were killed in an airstrike. And as a Palestinian in the diaspora, I'm always saddened by the de death tolls rising in Palestine. But I'll be sharing a story about how it hits home for me just like it can and has hit home for several other Palestinians. About over a year ago, my 14-year-old cousin in Palestine, Uday Abu Khalil, was protesting in the West Bank for the people in Gaza. People in Palestine are protesting for other Palestinians in a different uh, strip. So the West Bank is different from the Gaza Strip. He was in the West Bank protesting for the rights of the people in Gaza when he doesn't even have rights. Just because he sees it as a uh, is in more demand. He was 14 
He was not armed. He used his voice and flag as his weapon. But Israeli occupation soldiers still saw my baby cousin as a threat and shot him in the stomach. When our day was shot, he tried running away. But Israeli soldiers thought that wasn't enough for him. They shot him in the back a second time while he was running away. He was unconscious on the ground and his friends carried him and rushed him to the nearest hospital. Hospitals in Palestine are immensely underfunded and underdeveloped. And he went through several surgeries and although he woke up from a coma, he succumbed to his wounds. My cousin Arday became a martyr at 14 years old on Wednesday, May 23rd, 2018. That is the day I learned that Israeli soldiers don't just shoot unarmed children. They shoot to kill unarmed children. And although I knew Palestinians resist everything, I felt weak at the time. My cousin's death assured me as to how resilient Palestinians are. My aunt said, stop crying over my son. He is a martyr. He died for Palestine. Let's all take that in for a second. A mother who just lost her son to Israel is telling us to stop crying and honor his life. His coffin was draped in Palestinian flags and kufiyas as we see here today. And with the word Shaheed Day on his grave. Palestinians don't send condolences anymore. They honor the family on their son becoming a martyr. We don't have time to be sad in Palestine. Like I said, over 97% of the people in Gaza are depressed. If we were to mourn every single Palestinian shot by Israel, we would be in an everlasting sadness. We, we instead shift that narrative and we create this culture of martyrdom to honor their life and know that ultimately they are the part of the larger goal of Palestinian liberation. That's the dynamic in Palestine. Palestinians die all too often for us to consistently mourn. Sacrificing yourself for Palestine is seen as the highest honor someone can achieve, especially as a child. Our day was brave, courageous, and only 14. Palestinian children don't have time to be children under the occupation. He was one death. And we've seen that with the recent Gaza massacre. We've seen little kids as young as five years old huddling over their little brother or sister to save them from the next bomb. These kids are stripped of their childhood. They're forced to grow up. We've seen recently a video on Facebook of a kid not older than 10 years old at his parents' funeral, both of his parents. And you know what he did? He stopped crying and he wiped his tears with the Palestinian scarf. This kid is 10 years old. Like, just put that into perspective. And with my cousin, I just recognized that that was just one death. And he had a story, and he has a family who misses him. Now imagine Gaza. Imagine the 34 martyrs in 48 hours. That's 34 stories. That's 34 families broken apart. Just take that in for a second. 34 families are no longer family because of Israel. And although Palestinians have never and will never let a death toll stop them, we need to start humanizing these martyrs. We will resist everything it takes for our basic human rights in a liberated Palestine. It is our duty for us in the diaspora to use our point of privilege to make our voices heard. We will finish my cousin Arday's fight for justice in Palestine and we'll never let a chancellor mass mail or any Zionist on this campus stop us from educating the large masses. Thank you. Salam Ahmad, 28 years old. Wa'il al Nabi, 43 years old. Asma Abu al Atta, 39 years old. Ibrahim Abdul Al, 17 years old. Ala Shitawi, 32 years old. Suhail Qanita, 28 years old. Islam Ayad, 19 years old. Rafat Ayad, 54 years old. Amir Ayad, 8 years old. 
Ismail Abdul Al, 16 years old. Mu'min Qaddum, 25 years old. Mahmoud Hatat, 19 years old. Ahmed Abdul Al, 23 years old. Muhammad Sharab, 28 years old. Haytham Al Bakri, 22 years old. Yusuf Abu Kamili, 35 years old. Ubad Al Kurdi, 28 years old. Muhammad Abu Al Muammar, 25 years old. Rasmi Sawakra, 45 years old. Yusra Sawakra, 43 years old. Maryam Sawakra, 45 years old. Muhannad Sawakra, 12 years old. Muaz Al Sawakra, 7 years old. Wasim Al Sawakra, 13 years old. And two unidentified Sawakra family members. Let's please take a minute or two and honor all these lives that we've lost. campus by Zionists and Chancellor Jones, mm -hmm. Danita Brown, and other black faces in power that really don't mean black power. The fact that some people don't understand that this is not a conflict. A conflict is between two parties of equal power, of equal measure. This is a massacre. This is an assault. This is just like when they call it the race riots back in 1919. No, that was white folks killing black people. It wasn't no right. Just like in World War II, it was Germany versus America. Those are two solidified nations. This is an occupation. And I just want people to understand that this occupation is a bigger, a bigger conflict across the globe against white supremacy, against capitalism, against colonialism. The fact that we have members here today who have had family members affected by this and they are on across the world shows how serious this is. This is not something that's just, you know, we look at it on our uh, Twitter pages and we just shake our heads. No, this is hitting home. This is right here and it is up to us. Don't think that this rally means nothing because we have some people here who would like to record and uh, would like to probably send that to some uh, higher ups. Mm. Uh, and I think they know who I'm talking about. Uh, I won't acknowledge them though anymore. Eight years old, 16, 19, some of the age, these are children that they're killing. Children, that's genocide. I don't understand, that is genocide. You control 98% of the water. The majority of the water is unclean. That is genocide. That is genocide. And this is how, this is the reason why as a black man and as a Muslim, but as a black man, my struggle is equal to the struggle of the Palestinian people because Flint, Michigan, they don't have clean water. And that's majority black. Palestinians do not have clean water in Palestine and that is controlled by Israel. There's, I don't understand why some people don't see how 
Our revolution is one. This revolution is one. It isn't until the Palestinians are free. This is what Nelson Mandela said. It isn't until the Palestinians are free that our freedom means something. It isn't until that all the black and brown people that are constantly running, constantly being attacked by white supremacy across this country, here on this campus and abroad, it isn't until we all come together as one, as a coalition, that is when change is gonna happen. And guess what, we will bring that change. And on this campus, we gonna set a statement. We gonna speak loud and proud. Yes, sir. We already know what's coming up. We got Chancellor Jones on the ropes. We got this administration on the ropes. We gonna have Israel on the ropes. We gonna have Donald Trump on the ropes. We gonna have United States of America, Europe, all these white supremacist nations and all the powers that be on the ropes. Cause we are no longer going to settle for any compromise. We've been compromising our lives way too long and I say no more. No more will I compromise how I live. No more will I compromise how I can walk at night and then some white guys on a truck want to say racial slurs. And we're not even at election season yet. But guess what? They gonna say something if I apply for an FOID though. They gonna say something when we start defending ourselves. But guess what? We're the ones that always remain peaceful. But we're the, always the ones that are dying. This is a peaceful rally right here. We always think, they always say be peaceful. Every time we are peaceful, we're still killed. 14 year old, he, a, a, the kafia, a flag, that's his weapon. Still killed. Brothers on the street here in Chicago, in the United States of America, peaceful, still killed. That's not the same narrative when a white guy who's probably naked on drugs or whatever, running up and down the street, yelling with a knife, he gets to live. But let's, regardless of that, understand that this is so much more. It's so much more than just individual racism. This is institutionalized. This is, it, they've got money. <laughs> they got money put into this university to defend genocide. And this is a university that claims diversity and inclusion. Uh. They should include the money. Blood money, that's what they include. They include blood money and that $3.3 billion endowment that they still won't even give scholarships for black and brown students. They won't use that money to fund a house, a cultural house for the Palestinians. They won't fund the institutions that are for black and brown students. I mean, it would be kind of hypocritical if they did, because it's blood money, but this democracy, this harem vote democracy is already hypocrisy in general. Everything about white supremacy is hypocritical. Again, we got the university on the ropes. I stand in solidarity with Palestine to the day I die. Again, that is a privilege. We all have privileges. Let's use our privileges to dismantle, dismantle white supremacy here and abroad. Free Palestine. <laughs> has left many people mourning, helpless, and wondering why the world is silent. As Muslims, we understand and follow the teachings of our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. In a hadith or a quote from the Prophet, he says, the believers in their mutual kindness, compassion, and sympathy are just like one body. When any part of the body suffers, the whole body feels pain. Our brothers and sisters are hurting around the world and we can't rest 
until they experience the freedom and justice that they deserve. They are always on our minds and we must continue to speak out against injustices of all degrees and understand there are problems that need to be addressed. We cannot allow ourselves to become desensitized to death worldwide no matter how often we are faced with tragedies such as the recent one. Whip. Anywhere else in the world when our brothers and sisters are suffering, we must come together and take a stand against it. As students here at U of I, we may feel powerless and helpless when we learn about these tragedies and crimes against humanity. But the truth is we are not. By creating a united front in our communities and on our campus, we can bond together and speak up for all the voices around the world that are being silenced, killed, and hidden. By educating ourselves about what is going on and learning about these tragedies, we can avoid falling into the dangerous trap of being misinformed. Our hearts and our prayers are with the people of Gaza and Palestine. So now we're gonna have Peter from the Party of Socialism and Liberation come speak. Thanks. I'm uh, Peter from the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Um, so this week, Israel, Israel marked, um, you know, there's a marking of another brutal chapter in the history of the illegitimate settler colonial state of Israel with the brutal bombing of Gaza, killing 34 people and injuring 111 more. Um, you know, a lot of people balk when you call Israel a settler colonial state. You know, they point fingers at both sides. They say there's plenty of blame to go around. We need to take a nuanced and objective look, they say. But I'm going to quote uh, Franz Fanon, the famous anti-imperialist. For the colonized subject, objectivity is always directed against him. Mm. You can't be objective when it comes to colonialism. Mm. If you attempt to stand in the middle between a colonial regime and a national liberation struggle, you're actually attacking the national liberation struggle. And without a doubt, the illegitimate state of Israel has been a colonial regime. The founder of modern Zionism, Theodore Herzl wrote a letter to the imperialist and white supremacist Cecil Rhodes in 1902 to solicit the, his support in the creation of Israel. He said, you are invited to make history. Now, he admitted that Rhodes, you know, was preoccupied with colonizing Africa. So he wrote, why do I happen to turn to you? Because it is something colonial. That's right out of Theodore Herzl's mouth. Mm. The first prime minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, described the early days of the formation of Israel by saying, we were not just working. We were conquering, conquering, conquering a land. We were a company of conquistadors. Mm. In 1940, the director of the Jewish National Land Fund said, it must be clear there's no room for both people in this country. There is, and there is no way besides transferring the Arabs from here to neighboring countries to transfer them all. We must not leave a single village, a single tribe. Mm. You know, people, people, uh, people ask, um, you know, wh why are we, why don't we give some voice to the, uh, the Israeli side, the Zionist side. Well, there you go. I just did. Come on. If you examine what the founders of Israel actually wrote, you can't reach any other conclusion that it's a settler colonial enterprise. So the struggle for the liberation of Palestine is a national liberation struggle, a struggle for decolonization. To consider, our, to consider ourselves progressive, we must always take the sides of colonized people and support their struggle for liberation. But we must also frame this in the global context of decolonization struggles, as well as anti-imperialist and anti-capitalist movements. Israel has gained the support of Western imperialism and capitalism, not because it controls these governments, as some people say, but because Israel and its supporters are running dogs for Western imperialism. In 1951, an Israeli newspaper said, strengthening Israel helps the Western powers to maintain equilibrium and stability in the Middle East. Israel is to be a watchdog. If for any reason the Western powers should sometimes prefer to close their eyes, Israel could be relied on to punish one or several neighboring states whose discourtesy towards the West went beyond the bounds of the permissible. And Israel has lived up to this. You know, they've invaded Lebanon and New Egypt, numerous other Arab countries, but they've also lent support to the apartheid South African government before its fall. They trained and armed the Guatemalan military in the 1980s when they slaughtered the indigenous people there. They trained the torturers of the Pinochet regime in Chile, mm -hmm. and they supported the, the genocidal wars the U.S. fought in Vietnam and Korea. Mm -hmm. 
Colonialism is deeply entwined with capitalism, especially the age of imperialism, and Israel is no exception. We can only fully understand this in the context of capitalism and colonialism on a global scale. And having an understanding of the struggles around the world will make us stronger. Zionists and the right wing forces have the state and media on our side, but if we build solidarity with working and oppressed people around the world, then we will be stronger. But we have to build that solidarity first. We must recognize and show support for the struggles of indigenous people everywhere. The United States government continues to violate the sovereignty of indigenous nations as they push for more pipelines, telescopes. The African diaspora is facing police violence and mass incarceration. Indigenous nations in Brazil and the Philippines are fighting against mining interests encroaching on their lands. And a right-wing just ousted that country's first indigenous leader. We can learn from these struggles. We can build solidarity around the world. And we can build and find the strength with this multinational solidarity to over, overcome the power of capitalism and imperialism. We can win the right of self-determination for indigenous nations. We can end imperialism. We can secure, secure the right of return for those in Gaza, the end of this brutal occupation, and achieve a free and democratic Palestine. This isn't what we should expect from our countries, from our leaders, from our people, or from our world. Students Against Sexual Assault will stand in solidarity with Palestine because we recognize that a world where 8-year-olds and 14-year-olds and children and families can be slaughtered at a whim is not a world we want to live in. And it is not a world that we will accept. A world where innocent people are going to be slaughtered day by day, month by month, year by year, is the same world that allows rapists and abusers and perpetrators to go unpunished. This is the same world we live in, one world. And this isn't normal. This isn't what we should accept. This isn't what we should condone. And this definitely isn't something we should be silent about. When human rights are being oppressed, when human rights are being destroyed, when they're being removed, ignored, we can't remain silent because silence is violence. Yeah. I'll say that again. Silence is violence. Each and every one of us here with the privilege to do so has the responsibility to speak. We have the responsibility to use our voices, to use our platform, to speak for those who are less fortunate than us. Because if we don't, we're being a part of a system. We're being a part of a world that oppresses us, that puts us down, that won't listen. The government isn't here for the Palestinian people, so we have to be. The administration isn't here for the Palestinian people, so we have to be. Because the administration isn't here for survivors, so the Palestinians are here for us. Thank you so much, Raghava. Next, we're going to have a speaker from BSFR come up. Check, check, check. I'm probably doing a lot. Check. My check. My check. Free, free Palestine. I'm a co-lead for Black Social Revolution, uh, founded in 2015 on this campus. I'm here today to speak on the solidarity of black students, black people ac across the nation, the black dias diaspora, within solidarity to Palestinians. I'm just going to list a few names of the Ferguson. Because Ferguson and Palestine is so deeply connected. DeAndre Joshua, 20-year-old, found shot dead in the car. No evidence, ruled a suicide. Darren Seals. Shown in the car, burned alive, ruled a suicide. Marshawn McCrell, Columbus, Ohio, shot in the head. Again, a Ferguson activist, ruled a suicide. Eric Crawford, fatally shot himself, uh, supposedly, in May 2017. Again, ruled a suicide. 
Daya Jones, a person connected to this campus who, who uncle worked with Speak True Collective, an organization on this campus that I'm a part of. He was hanged from a tree, found in his mom's backyard, again ruled a suicide. And Basim Masuri, a 31-year-old Palestinian American who frequently record uh, Ferguson activists, he was found unresponsive on the bus, again ruled a suicide. It's time 